recently, uh, recently, we have modified our hypothesis even further with a concept that this APOE locus is involved not only in diseases, but also in aging. So today I'm going to share with you this research journey. Let's get started. <clears throat> I have divided my talk into three sections. First, APOE gene and its genetic signals in disease. This is like a background and mini review of what we currently know about APOE gene in disease. In the second section, I will introduce the concept of 3D genomics and why we think that this APOE locus fit into this mechanism. And the third part is what we think the APOE locus involved in healthy aging. So the background of APOE, APOE gene is located on chromosome 19. It's a very small gene, only four exons. And two SNPs located within the exon four define the three versions of the gene, APOE gene, called E2, E3, E4. This E2, E3, E4 also referred to uh, as a genotype of APOE. And this APOE genotype has been studied heavily with human diseases. Currently, it, uh, there are more than 50 clinical uh, 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 disorders associated with this APOE genotype. For example, this is just part of this large list. And I'm going to take two for example, one is coronary heart disease. Another one is Alzheimer's disease. So this meta-analysis paper published in 2016, this based on 30 published studies. They include 11,000 patients and 17,000 control looking to the heart diseases. So it, it, Basically, they use the APOE genotype E3 as a baseline and compare to E4. And this graph is the main outcome of, of the result. And this plot has been uh, used heavily for genetic study. It's called forest plot. And that's showing the odds ratio, this, all these different studies. And with an E3 as a reference or baseline, the odds ratio set as one. And compared to E4, we see all these different studies shift to the right side. So this plot showed the direction effect size in 95% confident interval. And the combined analysis overall show that the, compared with the E3, the E4 allele, has an odds ratio of 1.46 that's shift to the right. That means E4 has higher risk of uh, this heart disease. And that's why how genetic study is using the APOE genotype to do the association analysis. Next one is Alzheimer's disease. And this meta-analysis used uh, four published GWA, GWA that's genome-wide association studies. It used 7 million SNPs uh, to test on 25, over 25,080 cases and 48,000 controls. And this is the main outcome. And this is another plot, type of plot used heavily by the GWA study. This is called Manhattan plot. It did display a large number of data points. You see, this different dot represents a SNP. Just because data points are so huge, uh, this plot divided into 22 chromosomes in, in for their location, SNP location. So also account to account for multiple testing, the p-value cutoff is really stringent. It's five times 10 to the minus eight. Anything above that would consider a positive hit. So this, uh, this result showed identify 10 previous known AD loci 
in 11 new loci, one of the known loci is APOE show, showing up here on like chromosome 19. And let's use a different view to look at the genotype in AD dementia. This is another study. They use two cohort. One is clin clinical cohort, over 23,000 subjects. Another one, neural path, over 5,000. Again, use 3-3 three, three as a baseline or reference compared to 3-3 three, three subjects that carry E2 alleles has lower odds ratio. That means it's more protective. And also, if you see the neural path, the numbers go down even farther. So that's, that, that's clearly indication that neural path is more sensitive because you have this neural path pathology information to define the disease. And then for subject carry E4 allele, we see the odds ratio increase. And especially when you carry two copies of E4, it's jump exponentially. Again, neural path cohort, the number is even higher. So this APOE4 also has some gender effect. As we see this graph, the lower line represents men carry E3, E4 heterozygote genotype. The second one is women with 3-4. So we see women, the same three, four women has high loss ratio. The top two are uh, E4, E4 homozygote. Again, women has high loss ratio for, for AD. And throughout the years, uh, lots of different genetic studies, through uh, different independent genetic studies, through different eth ethnic groups, O show comes very consistently. E4 is strongly associated with AD. So we know people inherited E4 has higher risk of AD. And so here's more information about these two SNPs. These two SNPs located on, crumbs, on exon four of APOE gene. Uh, both SNPs change amino acid, and that makes three different versions of the proteins called APOE2, APOE3, E4 proteins. And at a time when the E4 started to merge as a, a strong signal in AD, that's the early 1990s, it's everybody, uh, especially the main research community, thinking that the protein is the main functional entity. And that's why people jump in right to the protein, APOE4 protein, thinking that must be APOE4 protein is doing this, to, that to cause AD. And the hypothesis generated is like APOE4 protein is responsible for AD risk and phenotypes. And this hypothesis actually uh, shapes the for the following 30 years of mainstream APOE research. And the question to be asked first is, what is the function of, the, of this APOE4 protein? Why is it different than E3 or E2? The second question is, why is what is the link between APOE4 protein and AD? <clears throat> if we look at the APOE protein, mm, the two SNPs and two amino acid changes uh, all, all occurred along the N-terminus, which is, is a binding domain for the receptor. So because the amino acid changed, the affinity also changed E4 greater than E3 than E2. And also for E4, it's unique, this arginine 112 amino acid, it interact with uh, glut glutamic acid 255 from a salt bridge. That's why you change the tertiary structure in the C-terminus domain, which bind to lipid particle influenced by that. That's why the E2 and E3 prefer bind to HDL, E4 prefer bind to VLDL. So from this protein structure and function, we know APOE is involved in lipid metabolism. If we look at lipid metabolism in human, there, there are different lipid particles and more than 10 apolipoproteins involved in these lipid particles. If we look at the major lipoprotein influence human vascular biology, the most critical important one are 
Apple A and Apple B is kind of understandable because the, those are the large protein occupy a lot, uh, heavily occupy these lipid particles. But Apple E is only considered as a second tier because one of the reasons is it's such a small protein. Okay. And then if we go back, if we go back to look at this clinical view of apple e genotype, <clears throat> by the, according to this previous hypothesis, if the genotype is really referred to the apple e protein, and apple e protein is uh, is uh, involved in lipid lipid metabolism, some of these disorders uh, can be easily explained by lipid metabolism, but not majority majority of this disorder cannot cannot, and not to mention Alzheimer's. So, but throughout the, the past thirty years, the consensus uh, of apo E four protein in AD is like this: uh, the apo E four protein can increase eta. A beta production and decrease A beta clearance. That's why the, it causes the plaques to form. And also, it increases neuronal death. That's actually lead to dementia. But then, whether or not this ApoE4 protein has direct causal effect to this, uh, to this result is still under heavy, uh, heavy debate. One of the reasons, one of the main reasons is a lot of this data were generated by animal models or cellular models. And there's are still quite a steep translational gap. And also, and that's also one of the reason currently you don't see a lot of cl clinical trials actually based on the apoe E. And that's that's also one of the reason. But also another question, uh, another big part of, about this hypothesis is the some unanswered question we will get into uh, the next slide. We showed this gender effect before, but let's uh, look deeper down. Uh, we can see the E4 effect actually peak, peaks around 60 to 65 years of age, but the effect goes away by 80s, above 80s. If E4 protein is doing something bad and cause AD, and this protein has been produced from day one all the way to the last day of our, our lifespan, how can the protein uh, is doing something bad all of a sudden to up to reach a certain point, it decide to behave itself and, and, and the effect goes away? That doesn't quite make sense. But the most, even more compelling evidence comes from this uh, population genetics. These are looking into the different ethnic groups. Uh, compare the homozygous E4 carrier versus E3 carrier. Keep in mind, these are homozygous, means they have two copies of the same E4 versus two copies of the same E3. And we see this odds ratio from the Japanese to Europeans to African Americans to Africans is actually quite a bit change and decrease. So if ApoE4 is the bad, uh, is a bad protein cause AD. How can in this all the E4 is identical within all these different population? How can there be such a differential uh, risk for AD uh, across these different ethnic groups? So that doesn't quite make sense. So based on that. <coughs> Uh, we think this original hypothesis, ApoE4 protein, is responsible for AD risk and phenotype definitely has room for improvement. And one, one thing we can look is go back to human genetic, population genetics. Uh, this is again, we showed previously, this is a Manhattan plot in ApoE locus. There's, there are lots of these SNPs dot showing showed up. That's very different from other loci. Other loci, at, at most one or two SNPs showed up, but ApoE has lots of SNPs. So we decided to take a closer look at this phenomenon. So we downloaded uh, uh, a database, a data set called AD Genetic Consortium Data. 
which consists of uh, over 26,000 AD and 29,000 controls. And we just focus, look at the APOE neighborhood region, about 19 genes, and the data set provides us with 252 SNPs. After statistical analysis, there are more than 20 SNPs show significant association with AD dementia and centering APOE actually expand to upstream Tau 40 gene and apoe C1 gene. So from this point, we know that AD signals actually cover all these three genes, not just one, it's just APOE gene alone. So that raises a question. The possibility of potential effect for AD could be one possible is just a single gene from APOE or this effect can be coming from this multiple gene of TOM40, APOE, and APOC1. So how do we approach this question? How do we separate this uh, possibility? And one thing is going back to look at the human genetics, population genetics. So currently over 130 AD associated susceptibility loci have been identified. These are uh, identified by GWAS, by whole exon sequencing, whole genome sequencing. So collectively, this genetic findings implicates that uh, uh, two major points. One is a failure of A beta clearance contributes to AD onset and progression. The second is the breakdown of innate uh, and adaptive immunity, immunity in AD pathogenesis. So this in immunity concept has been recently uh, uh, getting to the spotlight, uh, not like the previous only plates and tango. Immunity become a, a, another interesting point for AD. Based on that, if we look at this apoe C1, it, it's an apoe lipoprotein C1. It, it's like an apoe E bind to the lipid particles. But also APOC1 has another unique uh, function. For macrophage to be mature require the expression of APOC1. So that put APOC1 not only in lipid metabolism, but also in innate immunity. And then if we look at the another gene upstream of APOE COM40, this gene is a, is a mitochondria outer membrane protein. It forms this pore, uh, trans pore uh, allow nucleus protein in and out of mitochondria. So we know mitochondria function involves energy production, oxidative stress, and so forth. And mitochondria dysfunction has been well established as an early and prominent feature of AD brain. So right away, besides APOE, both Tom 40 and Apple C1 seem to be fit into the AD phenotypes. <clears throat> so previously we think, okay, maybe this hypothesis we can modify into a new hypothesis as multiple genes in Apple E locus contribute compound effect that leads to AD risk in phenotypes. Okay, and the, the question, immediate question can be asked can, and can be asked is, what is the mechanism of such a multi-gene effect from single locus? We are talking about a single site, but multiple gene has effects. So is there a it established model or mechanism can explain this? So that will lead us into the second part of our talk about 3D genomics. We know human genome consists of 23 chromosome pairs. If we look into the nucleus, and this chromosome has, each chromosome has its own territory. For example, apoe E is located on chromosome 19. If we look into the nucleus, chromosome 19 is always the neighbor it's always chromosome 11 and 21. If we look closely into the nucleus, we can see even more detailed uh, structures. First is we call AB compartment. This chromosome fold into this 
string ball like shape. And here represent by red is loose, blue is, is a dense. So the red part is the one uh, actively regulated region, gene act, uh, regulated. Uh, uh, has lots of uh, uh, expression and regulation happening. It's understandable because the loose part allow protein to be easily in and out to perform this regulation. But the dense part, the B compartment is much more dense that prevent protein to get in. So the B comp compartment is more silenced. If we then look at these stream balls like shape. We can see lots of interaction within the stream ball, but they don't interact with each other. This stream ball shape is also called topologically associated domains or TADs. Remember this term, we will be coming back to use these terms quite a bit, TADs. And then within this TAD, there, there are like a, this string and loop structure. Make even take an even closer look at the loops. Take a make an example. Uh, previously, when we identify gene, we would like to study gene regulation. We would like to then identify the core promoter and also distal regulatory regions. So those are like a one D one dimension view of gene regulation. But in reality, those co-protein and enhancer silencer are actually looped close together. It, it is this coexisting of this two sequence that would attract the protein complex and then will initiate the, the regula gene regulation. So this is what's the code, or currently called a three-dimension view of gene regulation. This is a more realistic view is happening inside the nucleus. So now we understand this loop structure and then this is a very fundamental basic idea of the 3D genomics. So the genomes are not only, are, are not organized in a straight line, but most, in, in most conventional approaches, study genetics result in the linear view of one dimension view of the genome. And now the 3D genomics has a huge impact on human diseases. The reason is as follows. Although many genetic associations have been identified from GWAS, there remain important unanswered questions about causal variance and their consequences. As GWA signals 10 to 4 in non coding regions. Okay, so a lot of previous identified GWAS associated with different diseases, when there's a SNP to identify, people just assume the gene, the closest the gene is the, is the functional gene. But with this 3D genomics concept, sometimes a SNP, uh, the functional gene that, uh, that the SNP regulated can be megabase away, can be very far away. It's not the, just the closest one. So that means a lot of these human diseases that you are study has to, uh, the chapter has, uh, people has to revisit this result and re rewrite the chapters in terms of the causal, causal gene involved. Okay, so now people start to identify importance of 3D genomics. And there are also new technology evolved, uh, 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 developed to study. For example, the chromosome confirmation capture technique, which look into this uh, region that closely uh, interact with each other. That's also, we can look at the TAD structure with this close interaction. So we can, uh, the technology, uh, the method is used uh, from aldehyde to cross link the chromosome and isolate this cross link link region and connect the end of this cross link and generate library. Once the library is generated, this library can be can be uh, can be uh, deciphered by next gene sequencing. So I'll give you one of the example. This is a TAD structure in Drosophila. The top part is showing the gene map, lots of gene listed, but the focus is here, a gene cluster. This is winless family members function in variety of developmental process, 
including regulation of cell growth and differentiation. So this bottom two is the chromosome conformation. The blue part is that they look at the young cell versus old cell. And within this windless cluster, we see young cell has lots of interaction, but old cell seems to completely blank the interaction change. This is exactly the idea of the looping, the looping change and change the TAD conformation. So these are loop. So this 3D genomics actually just this, like we initially we look at the 2D street map and now we have the way to look at 3D map. So it provides much more better new insights and clarity for us to probe into the genomes. And we know from this previous example, the TAD can be influenced by age. There are lots of the factor can influence this looping in TAD. For example, cell types. We know uh, different cells perform different function, but they, they all have the same genetic information. And it is this 3D genomics connecting them to do a different uh, expression and, and perform different tasks. And also genetics, when genetic variants occur, it can also change this looping and TAD structure. So different loop TAD structure can lead to change the gene regulation the expression that can alter the biological consequences. And, and that will bring to come back to the a apoe e gene. This paper just published uh, early this year. They again they use capture C to look at this region we are interested in. They found the apoe e promoter actually in interact with the Tom 40. And then they use uh, cell human human cell lines with astrocyte and microglia, apoe e promoter interact with Tom 40, different Tom 40 regions in the neuron cells interact with different region. So first of all, this interaction is a tip, very typical case of the, this looping and TAD structure. And second of all, this also explained that uh, a well-known phenomenon, we know APOE in the CNS is mainly produced by astrocyte and some produced by microglia, but Neuron, do, neuron doesn't produce APOE unless it's under stress. So with this structure confirmation differences, that's kind of explain why this, they have this different cell type specificity in terms of gene regulation. Also put this APOE locus into a uh, very well fit into this 3D genomics kind of concept. So previous question, what is the mechanism of this multiple gene effect? from a single locus. And we can say that like most likely this, this three genes are co-regulated with the same TAD domain. So <clears throat> previously with, we have this idea, okay, maybe the three gene involved AD signals. And then now we think these are within the same TAD. So we are dealing with a, a TAD. And one thing is dealing with one gene is one thing, and but now all of a sudden we have to deal with three genes. The complexity increased quite a bit, not to mention each gene has its own components. There are lots of variables we can, uh, that can influence, uh, that can influence study that make the research really complex. Initially, we look at the region uh, by looking at DNA. And then we also explore the, our, our own research, explore the RNA and epigenetics. Now with this new 3D genomics concept, we actually get, go back to the basic and revisit the gene genetic variants in the context of 3D genomics. How do we do that? We have to use a haplotype concept. So we just look at the SNP. Uh, for first, this need, uh, first need show here is define the APOE E4 versus E3. And also uh, we screen through multiple SNPs and identify two SNPs. One, each one, one uh, can represent one of the, uh, one of the gene. 
So now we re reduce it to three SNPs, reduce the complexity, complexity quite a bit. But then we still face another challenge is each cell, we have two copy of, of genome, uh, one, from, one is paternal, one is maternal. So if these SNPs are mixed SNP, we don't know which population this allele coming from. So we have to separate this chromosome into a single chromosome, and that's called haplotype. So basic haplotype is a single molecule, and you can define the genetic variance uh, on top of this single molecule. And why do we have to look at the haplotype? Because this different haplotype, uh, according to our hypothesis, they will form different looping. They will have a different, slightly different structure of looping than TAD structures. And then that would say this three genes within in this haplotype will have different version of this uh, haplotypes. And this different version would ch change the gene regulation, expression, epigenetic modification, and also the gene and gene products, their timing, quality, and quantity will be different uh, between this version. So how, and previously we showed this ethnic groups with different odds ratio. And they cannot, cannot be easily explained by APOE4 protein because they all have the identical APOE4 protein. But if we use this haplotype concept in, in thinking they have the diff ancestral differences in their haplotype means they all carry E4, but their flanking adjacent region has different uh, genetic variants, make them different haplotypes. So this different haplotype can cause different TAD structures can change gene regulation and, and, and cause this differential Alzheimer's disease risk. And, and how do we approach this haplotype? We, uh, we are currently under R&D to use a digital PCR haplotyping approach. So this haplotype, this digital haplotype, they use 96 well plates and each well actually has more partition can can have 8,500 partition. So all we need is dilute the genomic DNA to a point. We expect a lot of this will be single copy and separated into different partition. In this way, when we genotype it, we can actually define this haplotype structure of each of each individual. And with that, we have currently funded uh, project. Uh, we base, we use APOE as model. We know uh, APOE, uh, APOE4 carrier. Uh, they are much, a lot of E4 carrier would develop APO, uh, 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 Alzheimer's disease. And some APOE4 carrier escapes, uh, become resistance. We think maybe within these two groups, there's uh, two different types of haplotypes. All E4 haplotypes. One is high risk, another one is low risk. And high risk will, will have one version of this APOE locus gene, and low risk have a different version. And then this information can be used for better prognostication for Alzheimer's disease. And if we can fully demonstrate this haplotype differences, then we can carefully uh, go down to the, this looping structure and determine what is the cause for the higher risk or the higher protection for the, these differences. <clears throat> and now let's get into the third section. Why we think this APOE locus involved in healthy aging? Uh, we showed this data before the ADG was, there's a, there are lots of SNPs associated with uh, in, in the APOE region associated with AD. And if we look at the GWAS longevity, GWAS signal, this is again, uh, lots of SNPs should pop up in, on chromosome 19 in the APOE region. This particular uh, study is published in 2018. They use long life family study to evaluate the use of predicted lifespan data in genetic analysis of longevity. Uh, involved 583 families with 4,900 family members. 
case defined as subject survived to age 90 years and beyond, control defined as subject died before age 90, or whose current age did not exist 70 years. The main outcome identified 10 SNPs in six genes, and three of them is APOE, COM40, APOC1 is exactly our gene of interest. But this longevity study, the neither AD or dementia phenotype were included. You may see, think, okay, maybe this is just a coincidence. Let's take it, this is a, another paper, independent paper, GWAS data from European ancestry combining cohort and UK by a bank. The use case is 11,000 survived at or beyond the age of 90 uh, survival percentile control. 25,000 whose age death was at or below the age of 60 survival percentiles. The main outcome, they identified two loci, uh, GPR78 and APOE. And they also have a higher resolution of APOE in terms of 19. Again, we see this SNPs actually distribute among APOE 40, APOE and APOE C1. That actually takes us to this rethink our previous hypothesis that multiple genes in APOE locus contribute to compound effects that lead to AD risk and phenotype. Maybe that leads actually to longevity and healthy aging. And based on that, we can speculate that maybe Alzheimer's disease is simply a byproduct of compromise on, of longevity pathway. And also the preventive strategy for AD should be focused on pathway of healthy aging. And go back to this clinic, clinical view. Then when we start to look at APOE genotype, instead of a single gene, it's multiple gene. This multiple gene involves 3D genomic structure and aging. So a lot of this, if not all, can be explained by age-related disorder in both CNS and peripheral. Kind of makes sense, make a better sense to fit in all these different disorders. Okay, uh, I'm also going to take you from a different viewpoint and just focus a little bit on the CNS. Here's a human timeline. We expect our brain function will be uh, degraded throughout the years. But then we are hoping that our brain can be as young and as healthy as, uh, as possible. There are plenty of cases people live over 90 or 100 years still with very good cognitive function. So we know that's a, a, achievable. If we look at brain and consider brain might be, can, can be looked as a pipeline. <clears throat> there are lots of blood, uh, vessels and neural connectivity, glial cell clean up. In this pipeline, once the pipeline there's a leak, there'll be limited output. But if pipeline is healthy, will be abundant output. So robust pipelines can lead to abundant supplies and reserves and lead to longevity and healthy aging. So the difference between the two pipelines we know sometimes stress, injury, uh, inflammation, bad environment, lifestyle, or even genetic variants can cause the leak. And what's the uh, consensus for reduced de dementia risk, risk of dementia redu reduction is physical activities, balanced diet, uh, good cognitive input, reserve, and good repair, regeneration. Let's take these four points, do a, a little bit mix and match with the uh, APOE locus gene. APOE involves lipid metabolism, that's diet repair. APOE C1 lipid metabolism also in the immunity involve repairs. Tom 40 involves mitochondria function, that's involve physical activity, cognitive input reserve and also re repair regeneration. So actually, it's a much better fit of three genes into this aging picture, better than just a single gene like an APOE. So our previous uh, 
concept of separate the ApoE4 haplotype into high and low risk AD risk haplotype because uh, those will uh, represent this different version of this haplotype and genetic structure. And that would influence the 3D genomic. Perhaps that, that same concept can, own, can also be applicable to the uh, longevity because these different genes, different haplotypes uh, for long, uh, the gene expression will be different. The outcome will be different throughout the age, throughout the years. The, the effect accumulates even, even bigger. So this concept, our original concept was this data can provide better prognostication for Alzheimer's disease. And perhaps this information can also be used for longevity and healthy aging and especially for personalized prediction, prevention, or medic medicine or intervention. <clears throat> the beauty about this is these are genetic testing and we can just get the DNA, genomic DNA from blood in non-invasive procedure. And also the DNA will be the same. We can, we can actually collect the DNA and test this at a much earlier stage of life. And that will give us plenty of time to get into this personalized medicine and intervention. Uh, finally, I'm going to do a, a, a mini recap of some of the new concepts we, I introduced today. Uh, new perspectives of genomics. Conventionally, we all focus on 1D, genomics, which is primary sequence in structure involving DNA, RNA, protein. <clears throat> After completion of human genome project, uh, people start to focus a, a little bit on 2D, that's epigenetic modification involving DNA methylation, RNA modify uh, regulation, also like a non-coding RNA, and also protein binding modification, histone modification. And then recent, recently, uh, 3D genomics uh, actually uh, under, uh, under lots of spotlight, which involves chromosome looping, TAD, that, that will influence gene regulation, cell type specificity. How about 4D genomics? Let's pause for a second. Do you think there's a 4D genomics? I would say yes, because the special temporal modification, that's a 4D, that's involved age, environment, and lifestyle. And also this higher order of genomics organization has heavy, huge impact, influence on these lower orders. So these are all interconnected. That brings us to an in, a interesting question. Almost like if we want to get down to the bottom of aging and aging associated, associated disorder, we have no choice, but we have to look in, into this 2D, 3D, and 4D kind of setting to be able to go down to the bottom of, of, this, uh, of this. You will say, okay, wow, this is way too complex. But, but let's look at this. Uh, Maybe this will change your mind here. Previously, the biomedical research has been heavily focused on biology, a little bit on technology and computation. I think this has to be rebalanced. So the biology can generate new insights and form new questions. And then that would need new technologies that would generate new data and that will come into new data mining and new software. That will give us a, generally a better new hypothesis and better questions and ask and get into cycled again. So actually there are lots of new uncharted territories. If you want to extend into 3D, 4D genomics, there's lots of new uh, discipline can be explored. So I think, <clears throat> Also, for, for anyone who wants to get into a, a aging research, there's, there's a, it's, it's lots of new opportunities. So, and this is, I want to say, this work done my team, 
with my research team and support. And I'm going to stay on this slide and taking some questions. And also I'm going to, I have a last slide as a QR code and for you to uh, get your input or, or evaluation on today's talk. Okay, I'm going to stop here and I'm going to stay with this slide for maybe a, a minute or two, taking some questions, then I will show the QR code to continue the questions. Um, yeah, so did, um, Cheng, do you want people to raise their hand or just to start talking? Bill, did you have a question? Sure, yeah, um, this brilliant talk. Wow, it's just yeah. so wonderful. Um, but it worries me because uh, how, what use or how to ask the question. Um, can you comment on the utility of HOE for knock in mice, given this new view? I think that's, that's, that's a great question. I think those are the questions when you have the protein-centric protein viewpoint. That's a great tool. That's a great tool to work with. You, you want to study the protein function and, and consequences of protein. Okay, so that's a pros on this animal model. That's great. Uh, you, uh, because once you knock in, it's it's also it's also you create a, a isogenic environment. So there's no other genetic influence into that, and then you can look at this different protein and determine the protein structure and function. But I want to emphasize that's a protein centric viewpoint. And here today's talk, I I sort of elevate that viewpoint to a more genome genome viewpoint. And genome viewpoint has to rely on this different gene genetic background, genetic variance outside the gene, because that is how this looping structure, this topological associating domain actually form and determine. So back to the animal model with isogenic setting, you don't have this other genetic genetic variance. You are not going to see these genetic changes or genomic changes in outcome out of those models. And that's also applicable to something like a, like a CRISPR. People like to use CRISPR to 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 change uh, human cell lines. And Ideally, once you have the isogenic background, it reduces a lot of complexity. But my point here is then you're also losing that genetic, that genomic, 3D genomic, 4D genomic setting. Mm -hmm. You will not be able to answer it. And that's why, that's why uh, at the beginning, I think the, the animal model is great, but then there's some gaps actually when you want to bring, bring it back to the human. And you bring it back to human, you have to combine with the population, human population genetics to make the best out of this data. And if I can have a follow up. So if I understand correctly, even if we improve the model by knocking in all three genes, the TOM40, APOE, and APOC1, it would still be deficient even in that sense, because although we might capture the protein, we wouldn't be capturing the three-dimensional gen genomics. That is correct. And also this 3D, that, that is correct. And also this 3D genomics, this 3D genomics is also evolved change throughout the age. And we know like mice, like rodent model, it's only two years. Sometimes it's not long enough to make this switch and changes. And come to bring back to another question is, okay, consider like the rodent, like mice and, and rat. They, they are apple E, they don't have E2, E3, E4 equivalent. They have only one version of the gene. And all of a sudden you knock in the human, the three different versions of, of this. So their environment, the original environment, they evolved to handle one, just one, 
one version, and also all of a sudden you introduce this different protein, human heart like protein, into that, and with this different three version, that means the original environment is not set up to deal with that. So there will be some response reaction to that, and whether or not that can be reflect perfectly to the human setting, I think is may may or may not be be viable. Yeah, that, that, that's my point. Ooh. So uh, and the last question, and I'll be quiet because I'm sure, but this is intriguing. So if uh, corollary to that might be, or is, I guess, that when we use transgenics and we knock in a single protein and assume that we're only studying the consequences of that protein may not be true. If I understood you correctly, what we're, we could be doing is interrupting the three-dimensional genomic uh, interactions and therefore have all kinds of unintended consequences of the transgenic. Yes, that's true. You're, oh my gosh. You, you, you are you're safe, you're day. sending, <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, you're re rewarded nicely. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Song has a question. Hi, Chang'an. Thank you so much for another very provocative and informative um, talk. And I have to limit to 1D right now still, okay? So <laughs> have you resolved the risk haplotypes that are high risk for those three genes? Can you go back to the previous uh, the slide? Do you have the three genes and what have, do you know which are the highest risk AD haplotypes? of the three genes and then follow up question to that. Have you been able to get access to the different ethnicity uh, genotypes so that you could try to identify if uh, the Japanese sample perhaps have the higher prevalence of uh, the high risk uh, frequency of high risk uh, AD haplotypes thus have a higher risk of AD in their APOE4 homozygotes? Yes, yes. Thank you for that. yeah. That's a, that's a good question. And thank. Uh, currently, we are still under R and D on this digital hypertyping, and because it's a completely new technology, uh, require very fine tuning and development. And those are we are still under that stage. But so we haven't actually generally the precise hypertyping data yet. But as you said, our goal is once we have the methodology technology in, in, produ uh, in production line, our goal is go back to revisit human population, like you said, Japanese, and also we have some black uh, American uh, DNA. And also, uh, we are actually looking into some E4 carrier with resilience, those can be from a, a neural path pathology data or from some you know, clinical information we know. There are some E4 carrier uh, that resilient or to Alzheimer's. And we actually have uh, one, one example of that, that serve, that provide us uh, some, information saying, okay, this route is, is actually good. We can go through that because that resilient E4, we know uh, that person's carry E4, but the adjacent APOE and Tom, Tom, uh, the adjacent Tom 40 and APOE C1 SNPs are actually on a different allele compared to the Alzheimer's disease E4 hepatitis. So we know that we know that can be happen in different ethnic groups like say black or, or Japanese. And once our hypertyping uh, procedure is well developed, we, we will have a full production into this hypertyping. And you'll be able to get access to some of the Japanese data? Uh, currently we don't have, but we have Kami. Oh, okay. Yeah, Kami, which Kami stays in our possession. And I think, although we don't have good consensus, but that I think one, one, uh, one thing we can uh, kind of get around with it is those subjects are mostly diseases uh, already passed, passed. So possibly mm -hmm. there's no, uh, not under the HIPAA regulation, maybe. Okay, well, we look forward to updates then. Mm -hmm. 
or have results. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah, and also, Debbie, I think to uh, follow up your question, I think with this haplotyping information also it's important uh, when people doing the clinical trial try to recruit subject, if they can pre-type with this haplotype separate into high risk and low risk, I think that can also benefit the clinical trial become more sensitive about the either the drug or a compound you want to use. Instead, of you you test on a mixed population with both high and low risk. That's right. Okay, good. We have time for one more quick question. <laughs> Changing, that was amazing as always. Um, yes, yeah, so. Uh, any if we have any other questions i don't um i don't know that we have time for any more but any other comments okay oh cheng i have a quick one but maybe it's not so quick so on the on the graph that you showed with the uh different um i guess you would call it um ethnicity or race i i can't quite remember which bar the bar graph that you showed um yeah, right. So is that corrected for um, are the odds ratio? Is that corrected for longevity? Because you said that age is part of the 4D. So uh, I'm looking here and I'm looking at life expectancy is how does that fit into this particular graph? Because that's really startling. Right. <clears throat> I, I, I don't know your answer. I have to go back to deep dive into the data, data set uh, to be able to answer that. But I think uh, just consider <clears throat> this sample size is not a huge sample size. The reason is uh, E4, E4 homozygous is quite rare in population. Let's say E4, just single E4 allele is about 15% in Caucasian. So if you want the E4, E4 homozygote, you can go down to three or 4% on the population. So that means this data set, the sample size is quite small. Well, thank you very much. We are out of time. And please put up your QR code again, Chengen. I, I think we some of us missed it. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah, why don't we leave that up for that this final few seconds so that everyone can fill out um, for this, as always, amazing talk. Um, those of you going, I think David and I are going to a new number to meet with Elise. All right, thank you very much. Right, thank you. Is oh, this QR code yeah. working for everybody? Wait, that's not oh. working for me. Is it? And was this something I'm doing wrong? Here, let's see. Cheng Yan, I probably miss uh, talking to you. I think the talk's going away, but are you applying for that FOA that just came out? It's not really genomic related, but. Oh, yeah. Oh, I don't think you can hear me. Oh, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not. Uh, I currently have two active funded you're, projects. You're doing yeah. great. So. Right, right. And, <laughs> yeah, I like to generate a little bit more of this data, in, especially establish this hover tie. And then that procedure, that, that methodology can be expanded, can be spin up to lots of other projects. And that would be sure. the time to, to to actually uh, with uh, taking collaboration and writing more grant proposal. Yeah. Do you have a good idea of when you'll have that up and running? And is it going to be like a pretty laborious methodology or is it? Oh, yes. It's, it's, it requires a lot of uh, fine tuning. Uh, yeah. And also not to mention the pandemics. <laughs> the pandemic, so there's a huge setback in, in the instrument wise, the reagent wise, uh, lots of things happening. Okay. So I what you guys <laughs> discussing. that's a very important discussion between Angela and Cheng En. So I'm going to switch okay. to another Zoom meeting, but you all could keep talking. Very important. Okay. Okay. So, so I'm going to stop it and we can, we can talk just uh, uh, yeah, over the phone. <laughs>